Welcome, everybody, to the Rothermere American Institute for the annual Esmond Harmsworth Lecture. You're very warmly welcome. And to those of you who, for whom this is the first visit to the REI, an especially warm welcome. Uh, this lecture is, exists because of the generosity of Esmond Harmsworth, to whom we're immensely grateful for making it possible. And it's a huge pleasure to have to talk to us this afternoon a most distinguished colleague from the University of East Anglia, Christopher Bigsby, who is going to talk upon the subject on which he is so deeply expert and has recently written. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, in 1965, Arthur Miller uh, was the victim of a death threat. Uh, the letter insisted that Jose Quintero, who directed uh, Eugene O'Neill's Marco Millions at Lincoln Center, should be fired. If he wasn't, then Harold Clerman, Miller's producer on All My Sons, would have 10 days to get his affairs in order before committing suicide. If he failed to do that, the letter said, I hereby swear on the graves of my mother and father that I will murder Arthur Miller. It was signed Alter Ego, or The Establishment, and was written in the regulation Psychopath Green Ink. And it's tempting to feel that Alter Ego was an American theatre reviewer, certainly as judged by the response of such reviewers to Arthur Miller's work in America for the next several decades. For a curious fact was that if one madman wanted him dead, there were those in America who thought that he already was dead. Silent as far as the theater was concerned for nine years after a view from the bridge, that's between 1955 and 1964. He scored a real success in 1968 with the price, but thereafter play after play in America failed. An American reviewer of the British production of The Last Yankee in 1993 felt obliged in her review to tell her American readers that Miller was indeed alive. But for many, he had seemed to be dead for some time. When he did die in 2005, the New York Times passed the task of writing the obituary to its third string reviewer. And her remarks weren't wholly complimentary. His reputation, she said, rests on a handful of his best-known plays, and she noted that at one moment he was hailed as the greatest living playwright and at another as a has-been. This is his obituary. The right-wing New Criterion magazine headed its obituary, Arthur Miller, Commie Stooge. The equally right-wing National Review marked the moment by attacking what it called the darling of the left, husband of Marilyn Monroe, and self-appointed moralist, and the praise of those who mourned his passing in obituaries that were, it said, sanctimonious twaddle, pent-up liberal self-righteousness. The more sober Wall Street Journal helpfully explained, Arthur Miller was not well-liked and with good reason. You have to keep saying, these are the obituaries <laughs> of Arthur Miller. In 1984, the American critic Gerald Baldman, writing in the Oxford Companion to American Theatre, summed up Miller's career in a single sentence. Miller was a firmly committed leftist whose political philosophizing sometimes got the better of his dramaturgy. That's 1984. Miller wrote 17 plays in the 50 years after A View from the Bridge in 1955. Just four of them made it to Broadway. Several never even made it to New York. And somehow one of the greatest American playwrights had been written out of the American narrative, as he'd been declared, of course, un-American by the House Un-American Activities Committee and the Congress of the United States, and had his passport, sign of his Americanness, withdrawn by the State Department. So why did this come about, and why, when his reputation as a writer of new plays was fading for the last 37 years of his life, was he celebrated in this country? There is um, a Tennessee Williams play in which a gypsy woman's virginity is restored with every full moon. It's a good trick if you can pull it off. And in a sense, though, it's a very American trick, 
because Miller lived in a country that leans into the future, an immigrant country in which the past is precisely what has to be transcended. That wasn't Miller's position. He spoke of the tongue of history being torn from the mouth of Americans. As he remarked, there seems to be no past in America. To him, the denial of the past was a denial of moral logic and identity alike. Hence the electrical discharge between 1692 and 1953 in the crucible. To deny the past was to snap the spine of morality, to dislocate act from consequence and hence deny the fact of responsibility for that past. And without responsibility for one's actions, where could identity be said to reside? This playwright whose characters were inclined to shout out their names, however equivocal the gesture, I'm Willie Loman, I'm not a dime a dozen, give me my name, Eddie Carbone, Eddie Carbone, Eddie Carbone, I am John Proctor still, and there's the wonder of it. Willie Loman, Miller once said, was trying to write his name on a block of ice on a summer's day. To many American critics, though, as a result, he seemed to be sidestepping the present. They rejected the analogy at the heart of the crucible, insisting that 1692 had nothing to do with 1953. There were no witches, they said, while there were communists. Though, as Miller pointed out, to declare that there were no witches in colonial Salem would have been to deny God's word, not on the whole a wise course, since the state then was defining reality and it enforced its interpretation with the gallows, the ultimate dangling modifier. American critics were bewildered with the frequency with which he turned back to the Depression, which seemed to have no lessons to teach to a society getting daily richer. His critique of the American dream, they suspected, was a product only of his Marxism, or what a number of his critics prefer to call his Stalinism. What his critics asked in the 1960s did he have to say about the present, the Vietnam War, for example? That, Miller explained, was precisely why he turned to the past. This man who attended one of the first teach-ins over the Vietnam War and personally flew to Paris to negotiate with the North Vietnamese. The Vietnam War, he insisted, had a prehistory. At a peace rally, he read out a poem which he'd written which traced back from the American involvement to the history of French colonialism, not something that they were very inclined to do during the Vietnam War. He even made a film turn play about Vietnam called The Reason Why, but it's virtually unknown and therefore forms no part of the assessment of the man and his work. From his point of view, though, incident at Vichy, set in Vichy, France, uh, and staged in 1965, bore on these ev events, as did The Price, produced in the pivotal year of 1968, a play which looks back to the 1930s and there finds the origins of present pain. He hoped his stress on the past would offer a lesson to those who responded to current political issues as if they had no precursors, no rational connection to past errors, as if America, like his characters, believed it could simply walk away from the consequences of its actions. The question his own drama asked, he explained, was what happens when you can't walk away? <laughs> 